Okay, and we are rolling. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Today we have Travis Ward, who is by trade a director of photography, but is dipping into color correction, which is fairly a fairly natural thing for directors or photographers to want to color their own stuff. And so he'll be talking a little bit about his his work, his experience, and in, in um, as a director of photography and also as a colorist. Travis, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Renee. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I didn't go to school for anything video related. I uh, was an English uh, major, had a bachelor's in English, uh, and then kind of got interested in screenwriting, which got me into filmmaking. Um, and then I was ended up being the guy in my group who had a, a Canon T2i, a little DSLR camera. That was back in like 2011, so I think I kind of started shooting around then. Um, you know, just like a lot of sketch, sketch comedy, little little bits like that. Um, and then kind of uh, springboarded from there. Um, really got interested in cinematography and becoming um, a DP. Um, so that was around 2014 when I kind of started doing it seriously. Shot a web series. Um, a few years later, I shot a feature with lots of shorts and random stuff in between. Um, and then in 2019, uh, I kind of went freelance full-time. I'd had a full-time job before then. I was working a tech company and kind of had was in that for too long, kind of felt like I needed to get out. Um, and so uh, I kind of a, all along that time, um, the moment I got my first Blackmagic camera, it was a Blackmagic cinema camera, the original, I think that was around 2014, um, it came with a copy of DaVinci Resolve. So at least starting then was when I kind of started playing with color. But really the last five years is kind of when I you know, got my, my pipeline like sorted out, uh, making sure I have uh, the hardware set up, really started taking it more seriously, um, as well as additional trainings and things like that. So I am uh, mostly a DP. That, that's like what I like doing. But uh, being a colorist is also just a really nice way of figuring out how to control the image. Um, and it's just something that uh, I, I do think a lot of DPs are doing these days. That's awesome. Okay, so starting out, you were originally interested in screenwriting. Yeah. So so before then, what, like, what got you, what inspires you about the filmmaking process and why screenwriting at first? Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, in my... Senior year of college, I kind of started getting interested in screenwriting, but by that point, I was too far along my track. Um, couldn't really get into any screenwriting courses be because people who were, you know, majoring uh, in, in that or those fields got priority. So, you know, I thought about it, talked to some friends about making some short films or something. That never happened. Um, but, yeah, I just, I think after that, I... I, I was still interested. I was doing a lot of writing after I graduated. Um, was you know looking at maybe doing like some short stories or a novel. Um, but for whatever reason, um, I kind of recognized that film was uh, a medium that really um, affected me um, more than you know a lot of others. Um, maybe I don't know if I you know put them side by side. Like what do you write more or enjoy more like books or, or film, uh, anything like that. But I just wanted to find a way to get involved in film and filmmaking process. And because I enjoyed writing, um, screenwriting seemed like the best avenue for that. Uh, so I started uh, just writing, kind of playing with some ideas. I had a good friend of mine who was kind of uh, a partner of mine when I first started doing filmmaking and video. Um, he uh, was also interested in writing. So we kind of encouraged each other, uh, did a lot of writing together. Um, and it's kind of funny because I just, I really don't do any writing. I haven't done any writing in the past five plus years. That was mostly along around the time before I decided I was going to become a DP. It was like, you know, like I said, you're with your group of friends. You have like a cheap DSLR camera. You're trying to think of stuff to make. So you're writing a lot more. And then when I was like, I need, I want to get good at camera work, um, cinematography and, and color work, I kind of just focused on that. So it was like a long progression, um, and it is screenwriting is something I, I, I would love to go back to sometime. Um, I'm always, you know, thinking in that way, but I just really haven't had the time to sit down and do it. 
Yeah, no, I completely understand. So the transition from from screenwriting over into becoming a director of photography was originally started because you're hanging out with your friends and you're figuring out how to create things, but you were the only one with a camera. Yeah. So then you had to master that tool. And then from there, you just focused all your curiosity in mastering that. And that's kind of like how you got to where you are right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've always been kind of technical minded when it comes to, I was like, you know, the computer, computer kid in our, in my family. So I would always fix the computer when it had issues, you know, clean it out. Um, and so it kind of followed that way when I got into filmmaking. Um, I was kind of really interested in like the craft and a lot of the technical sides, like how things work. So um, I would usually have more of the equipment. Um, I wasn't buying like a ton of expensive gear. We were, you know, getting like cheap lights, um, doing a lot of DIY PVC rigs, <laughs> uh, which are just, again, fun in the same way because you're kind of, you're problem solving. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the aspects I really like about uh, filmmaking in general is the problem solving aspect. Uh, we want to achieve this, but these are our constraints. How do you do that? Um, so yeah, uh, it was just something that kind of always appealed to the way that my brain works. Um, and it makes a lot of sense looking back that, yeah, this is the area that I would get interested in. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as the computer kid, did you build your own machine to edit? Is that kind of like the natural next progression where you had to research a capture card and how to get it all in there was it dslrs with capture cards or was it uh usb for not, dslrs yeah not dslrs but actually the dslr wasn't the first camera i had mm. the first one was it was like a canon h maybe like an hvx something like that oh, but it was no. a mini dv mini d oh yeah and so yeah the tapes mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah I, I built my own computers i you know built my own computers all through college uh, but yeah, that was the first camera that I had when I moved here in Austin. That was actually 20, 2009. I had gotten that camera. Um, and yeah, I had to install like a, a Thunderbolt card or a Firewire card on my computer. Um, and you would plug it into the, the camcorder, plug it into the computer, basically roll the camcorder and it would record to a file on, on the PC. So yeah, no capture card, but basically the, the exact same process. <laughs> That was a lot of fun. I remember those days. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Just even even like a year later when I got a DSLR, it was like, oh, wow, I just have to use this memory card. It's so much easier. <laughs> That's really cool. So talk, talk to us a little bit about your uh, curiosity process or your process as you evolved as a director of photography and learning your craft. Like who inspired you? Um, how have you progressed along the way? Is it just the advice of like, well, I just went out there and started creating? Like for people, who would you recommend that are just starting out some pieces of advice? Um, I think when you're first starting out, you're, I mean, you don't know anything and you know that, but you don't want other people to know that. Um, so you may kind of enclose yourself in a bubble of, with, with me especially, because, you know, I was doing everything with my friends. And so that was like my circle, but you know, you kind of realize that's, it's pretty limiting. Um, cause you know, some of my friends were more casual about it than others. Um, uh, they were just, you know, wanted to have something fun to do every, every other week or so, but they didn't want to make a career out of it. Um, so I think the idea of surrounding yourself with people who are better than you, um, always is just like, to me, it's kind of rule number one, like work with people who inspire you, um, with people who, I mean, you want to learn from, you want to steal from. Um, I mean, I'm very like democratic with anything that I learn. I don't really believe in like trade secrets. I think the more everybody knows, the more the medium and the art form um, is elevated. Um, so just work with people who are better than you. Uh, get used to saying like, I don't know. Um, I would, would you mind teaching me? Do you have time? Do you have a way, do you have a direction you could point me in so I can learn this? Um, Obviously today, like, I, n I never went to film school or anything like that. I'm all self-taught. Uh, there's tons of YouTube uh, videos and lots of courses, which can be really helpful. I think a lot of YouTubers can go way far down, like, the, the gear kind of uh, pursuit. Um, so one thing, if you are doing that, one thing I learned is always try to learn from someone who's actually shooting things regularly. Uh, 
because um, it's just it's a completely different level of knowledge. Like reviewing gear from somebody who just reviews gear, from to reviewing gear as somebody who's actually out there using it mm. um, is is very important. Um, and I got burned a few times with stuff that I purchased, and uh, the review didn't mention things that would have obviously gone wrong on set. Um, so now, I mean, I'm more insulated. I have a lot more peers that I can actually go to, um, more sources that I can actually trust. Um, but I, I do highly recommend you find somebody, um, especially local, that you can kind of uh, work with. Um, if you have someone, even if they're from a completely different department that you worked on on set and you really enjoyed working with them, tell them and say, you know, I'd, I'd like to work with you or more people like you or groups like you. Is there anybody you can connect me with? Are there any other jobs? Can I work as a PA, camera PA, any kind of thing like that? Um, I think getting outside of your initial comfort zone and the insecurity with um, feeling like you don't know anything uh, but not wanting to admit that you're bad uh, is really important. Well, that's probably the best advice I've ever heard given <laughs> if you're trying to get started on set. Essentially is surround yourself with better people than you um, be humble always. in the fact that you know that uh, you're always in the process of learning. You're never trying to, you never arrive and and are a master. You're constantly learning. It's only when you decide to stop learning and just to keep getting after it and surrounding yourself with people. I love that you say, you, you see somebody, you recognize their talent, their strength, and you ask them, hey, uh, how can I surround myself with more people like you? How can I get on other sets that you can recommend, even if it's at the level of a PA? Because you're not really trying to get there to, let's say, uh, be a camera assistant if you're trying to learn director of photography. But you want to get on the set just to be around the people first. That's the first yeah. step. That's, that's, Definitely. that's great. That's great advice, Travis. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So, that, yeah, so we talked about some, some of the advice that you give in regards to being a director of photography, um, it's, sorry, director of photographer, and now talked about your kind of like a little bit about your process and your recommendations and how one can get started. And let's talk a little bit about that transition from like, okay, we're done filming and now we go into post. And the, the, your recommended process as someone who's brought on as a director of photographer and then wanting to still control the image in post as a color correctionist. And, you know, I've worked with many directors of photographers who want to color or at least oversee the colorist coloring their film. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about the world of a director of photography, director of photographer, and then going into post in, in regards to color and maintaining the integrity of the image of how it was originally shot through the vision of the director of photographer? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, and I think that landscape is really interesting now, especially as more um, DPs are uh, handling a lot of a lot more of the color work, or at least it's it's way more accessible. Um, even when I think in 2014, when I got my copy of DaVinci Resolve, again, it came free with the camera, the Blackmagic camera. Mm. Um, I feel like it was still like a few thousand dollars for a single software license. And now it's they have a free version, and there's like a three hundred dollars for the the studio version, which is the full version. So it's and you know, decades ago it was like tens of thousands of dollars for the software. So it's it's become a lot more democratized. It's uh, become a lot more accessible to people. Um, and you know, the advent of um, just color, digital color manipulation in general. Um, since you know the early 2000s um, or late late 90s uh, has also really changed things. So I think it can depend on your where you're the level that you're at. Ideally, like professional workflow, you would fig kind of be working with a colorist uh, before you even started shooting. Um, you know they may generate some some lookup tables, basically like some looks that you can use. Um, in camera while you're shooting to help you figure out like what the look is that you're getting. Um, that's not always possible, especially, you know, if you're not at the professional level level um, doing like feature films like that, because obviously that does cost more money. Um, 
otherwise, like kind of a standard review process would be it's very common to sit in with the client, which is usually the director of photography um, or and or the director um, and really kind of running through what they want those looks to be. You'd pick like a few hero shots. Um, you'd get an idea of what they want it to look like if you didn't have it already established beforehand before they even started shooting. Um, and you kind of start your workflow around those shots um, and really nailing the colors, the look on those. And then, you know, it, it can take a lot of review sessions depending on, depending on who you're working with, um, depending on what they're looking at the material with. Ideally, you want them sitting in the studio next to you because you can say you have a reference monitor that you know is calibrated. You know the color is representing the color grade that you're doing. They're not reviewing the color grade on like, you know, a, just a mobile phone or something um, where the colors look different and then they send you all kinds of weird notes because the color is off. Um, but typically, I feel, I mean, maybe I'm a little biased, but I do feel like the DP is kind of has the, the final say on what the image should look like. I think it can depend on the production and the production team uh, really who is some directors like to be really hands-on and have a lot of control over that um, and if the if the DP does have control over that it's probably was agreed upon beforehand that they're going to be the one handling the the image pipeline from you know from shoot to delivery um, so it can really depend and you know and I also work with you know I'm working on something with a friend of mine who does talent management at the Austin School of Film um, and you know I'm she needs like something that's a few minutes long colored like an actor reel and like I might be I'm going to be working on that later today for a couple hours um, something really simple um, still have a review process but you know they the stakes are lower you know it's not going to broadcast on tv you don't have to worry about standards to hit or anything like that uh, so I kind of do a wide range of things and always trying to learn from each of them no matter what the opportunity is yeah yeah, I'm sorry about that. Such a tough question there, Travis, because I think I feel like these are always like, well, it depends answers, right? Because there's just so many variables uh, to consider. Like from a producer's point of view, answering, uh, having a question like that is like, well, what's the budget? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because that's beautiful to be, be able to bring on a colorist um, and also to start that conversation early on. And I feel like, unfortunately, from my experience, whenever talking with people or putting a project together, you plan to have post-production included in the budget. But then as production starts going, starting to happen, that money from that post-production starts to now go back into production. So that way there's an actual finished film. Um, and the, particularly, I'd have to say in... Um, trying to trying to budget for your post production and and pay out and bring the, that team on early like your editors and also your colorist if not if it's not the same as your director of photography which it it probably won't be but um, your director of photography still needs to be compensated to be able to spend a couple of days with the colorist to make sure as he's mentioning to be able to make sure that they're maintaining the integrity or at least having the conversation of this is what what I was intending to do when I did it and you have lookup books and, and things like that to, to support them. Mm -hmm. But what I think is very interesting, which I, I'd like to get your opinion on is, yes, this is like, the, uh, because of technology and because things like you were mentioning about DaVinci Resolve, now it's free essentially for almost the complete studio version and only $300 more for it. And to be able to do magnificent, uh, having magnificent control over the image and also the accessibility of people being able to do it with the type of hardware that they need, um, is creating opportunities for content to be created that is uh, magnificent, wonderful, high quality content. As I'm continuing to produce, I'm starting to recognize that there are traditional positions that were once that came from like the Hollywood system that I was schooled under aren't, necess aren't necessary in a sense. Uh, I don't wanna say not necessary. They're not budget allowing, they're, they're budget allowing uh, positions and so yeah that makes a lot of sense that a director a photographer it could just be a producer and a director a photographer and both collaborating together to create a product for a for a client um you know like a brand storytelling mm -hmm. uh initiative for for a client but then i also i also find that the brand the the company themselves aren't 
knowledgeable in all of this entire process. And I feel like it's our job as creatives to be able to educate them in a way for them to understand why these things are very important. Because sometimes they're just like, I just want it to look good out of the, that's it. And they don't understand, well, these are all the other beautiful little things that we can do to to make it look really beautiful and good. Um, and I, I really love color and, and what what it can do to enhance the story. Um, and it, it's definitely something that if you think about going in, it serves so much. It's so powerful. There's a lot of films um, that I really enjoy, like with the color, like I think of like The Godfather and how and if you start studying color, how he always had like an orange and, mm-hmm. and, and the color of the orange uh, represented something in the film. And so when Marlon Brando's character, the Don, gets shot, there's all these oranges that spill over. And then whenever they're talking about death, you start to see how there's oranges Mm -hmm. placed everywhere. So it's just really beautiful if you get the opportunity to use color and those types of things, how it can really enhance the story. And you may not even know it unless you're really paying attention. Yeah. But um, that's amazing. I I, I really love this conversation with in color. And what are some things that people can can do that are interested in bringing on a director, a photographer, and who can also color their own things uh, to better prepare themselves so that way they can take advantage of all of these beautiful things that you have to offer? Um, That's a good question. And one I think about uh, fairly regularly because... um, Sometimes I think it's just something that people don't think about a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe, I I, I don't know. At this point, like, color grading has become so accessible. I feel like it's it's pretty obvious. Like, yeah, you you can, we can develop a look that you want. You know, we can make things look a certain way. But I do still, like, one of the directors I I work with the most, um, you know, we just shot, like, a short last year. um, And it's kind of ready for color. And. I asked, like, what were we? Were you thinking for for color? Um, what inspirations? And you know, and he's been this, like this for all the all the mini projects that we shot. He's like, oh, I, I'm not, I don't really know. Like, I just want it to look good. And I'm like, oh well, <laughs> I I can like do give it like kind of a standard treatment. But um, all that is to say is like, uh, I would just say think critically about what you want the image to look like. Um, you know, if when you were dreaming up this project, when you were writing it, like what images did you have in your head that may, that really spoke to you? Um, was it, can you, can you describe that image? Can you find things that are similar, like build a lookbook? Um, really whatever you can do to communicate the, the, the feeling, the texture, um, the importance of color in the film. Um, even if, the important thing is that color is not important, that you'd want things to be sort of uh, what you might call realistic, um, uh, you know, a little more muted. Um, you don't want the color to be distracting. Um, I mean, I think there there have been, one of my favorite directors, Andrei Tarkovsky, he, mm. he did a lot of his films. Um, he started working in black and white um, and moved into color from, you know, the, the sixties to the seventies. Um, and he was really adamant that, and, you know, even up until his last film, you know, he, there were some sequences that were basically monochrome, um, almost black and white, and then others that were in color. And he never wanted color to be like distracting, or if you have, if you do use color, it's, kind of representative of a shift in the narrative of the story mm. or the mo- the mental state of the characters. But again, without being like, uh, this is him personally, like not wanting it to be too um, kind of uh, like a, you're telling the, the audience what to think. Um, so that was, that that's a philosophy that um, is always kind of in the back of my head. Um, but yeah, there are times when like colors representing things can be really powerful if you want uh, the visual style of your film to be kind of a, a puzzle to be worked out by the audience. Um, I think that's really appealing um, just in like a really fun kind of way, like figuring out like, Oh yeah, why, why were the oranges? Uh, uh, why, why were they significant? Why is this color significant? Um, why would we give more emphasis to that? Um, I think it, it can really depend on what you want 
the, the visual style of the film to be. Um, so I would just bring it back to like, think critically about these things. Don't just say like, this is my script. I love my script. I don't care how it looks. Um, if you're watching some of your favorite movies and like a certain scene or a sequence just like thrills you or inspires you in some way, like, don't just say, wow, I really love that scene. Think critically about like, what is it about the scene that, that speaks to me in some way? Was it the way it's edited? Was it the way they paired sound like music with that uh, sequence? Was it the performance or was it the visuals? Was it the way the camera moved? Was it the, the way the colors popped in a certain way um, or emphasize a certain thing in the frame? Um, I think just always thinking critically is the best way to, to learn new things about yourself and figure out what you want your direction to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, man, I'm just so excited. I love talking about this stuff and just being able to get in here and just, just, you know, sharing back and forth about, you know, the philosophies. I love that philosophy. Um, that's a, that's a great one. I think, I think maybe like, what's a good reference film that demonstrates that, um, traffic would traffic fall into that category? Yeah. Traffic, traffic was interesting. I was just, uh, listening to like kind of not a review, but somebody like revisiting traffic. Um, and yeah, I remember, I think traffic might might have been early two thousands. I don't know if it was. I would assume it was you know color graded to look that way to have like those you know really cool scenes in the city, um, and something that's become like a bit of a stereotype at this point. But like the really warm like orange scenes, um, in I think it was yeah in Mexico mm -hmm. across the border, um, and then I can't remember the suburban scenes, but um, that would be a good one. Um, I feel like, you know, another obvious one um, in Schindler's List are scenes with, uh, uh, you know, the child in red. Um, and that's the only pop of color in until, you know, you see like scenes from today later in the movie. Um, I also think this may not exactly fit fit the bill, but I was thinking about um, Mad Max Fury Road and how that, uh, you know, when it was released, I saw it in... Uh, theater a couple times um it's like hyper saturated uh blues you know blues and oranges um you know there's some incredibly striking like night scenes which i'm i think were actually shot during the day and they d use color grading to give them like a blue wash but then you know you learned that the the director um he said like he had wanted to make it a black and white film <laughs> um, and so he released, like, he actually released uh, the, the black and white version later, but part of his reasoning was, like, I wanted to do it black and white. Um, it, for whatever reason, you know, we couldn't do that or we weren't given permission, so I just wanted to go in the complete opposite direction. If we had to do color, I wanted it to be, like, sort of this incredibly rich, saturated color that you can just feel, like, coming off the screen. Um, and I think of about that that it's like an interesting decision i don't know whether or not i like one of the versions more than the other mm. um i've seen seen both um but it's just a really interesting approach that i wouldn't have thought to take if you know somebody said you can't do a black and white movie and I'm like, you know, okay i'm gonna go all the way to the other other side <laughs> some kind of jedi mind mastery yeah. there like oh yeah well i'm gonna do it on the other yeah. side and you won't even you won't even know you're, i'm still getting my color. way yeah, yeah. <laughs> But and to your point uh, earlier, where you were talking about the fact that it's there is nothing. A lot of this in creativity is what inspires you, so that you can't really uh, learn that in a class. It's more of being able to in, tune it, learning how to tune into it, and then communicating it to your colorist, like you're saying, like, "Well, what's the texture of it? Is there something that inspired you? How did that make you feel?" Um, and the, in the essence of with. Um, with uh, Fury, um, Fury Road, great film by the way, man. That is a train wreck. It just doesn't yeah. stop. I remember mm -hmm. seeing that at at the AFI, and in the theater when it came out, and I was just like, oh my god, man, this it was a ride. It was yeah. it was such a ride. But there's an example of somebody who had um, didn't even have a vision for colorists like standing there thinking, well, the reason why I want this to be this way is because of this. You can totally go that mathematician approach, but. Also, it can just be something because it's just a creative decision intuitively that you're like, this is why I want to do this. Yeah. And you don't have to explain it to anybody. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and um, so that's why I think a lot, what's really cool about the arts and all these things that we're talking about here in particular with color, in particular with shots that you design, um, you don't have to have any rhyme or reason. It could just be like, that's just the way that I want it. And that's what makes it beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's, uh, I also, as being a DP, I think about that a lot too. Um, you know, sometimes I'll DP, uh, something and, you know, I, I was working with this one director who is very like, visually we were really similar and so we wanted to do all these like um kind of ambitious shots a lot of dolly work mm. um a lot of like really long shots um and there were some times when you know i kind of talked them off the cliff i was like what why are we like what is the point of the shot like do we need to be doing this or are we just going to be adding like a half an hour an hour to our day for a shot that's pretty but doesn't really serve any purpose but I don't, yeah, I don't necessarily think that a shot has to serve a purpose. I think that a shot being just nice to watch or nice to see in and like that can be the purpose, um, settling into something that's like pleasing to, to watch, or even if the way the shot moves a certain way, it'll draw you in, it'll build tension. Um, it's kind of like uh, moments in a script where it might just be a character moment. It doesn't advance the plot. It doesn't uh, even necessarily like build character, but it's something that kind of builds this sense of uh, atmosphere, of, of place, um, of setting. Um, I think that, I think it's a, a fine balance. I mean, you go too far into that and you know, there's no substance to your film if it's just uh, a lot of pretty shots or you know, moments that don't advance the script if we're in that world still. Um, so I think it can be both and it's really just balancing and figuring out what does this film, what do you want this film to be? Um, I've had people, you know, on really short films, a lot of people I work with are, you know, they, they're visually minded. They have a lot of influences that they wear on their sleeve. And so they're like, let's do a shot. I want it to be the shot from, from this move from, I want it to be like this Texas chainsaw massacre shot. And I'm like, does that like, we, we don't have the budget or the crew that Texas Chainsaw Massacre had. Um, are you just doing this because it's a movie you liked and you want to fit that shot in somewhere? Or is it is it actually contributing to the story? Does it make sense? Um, it's, I, I, I think about that whenever there's kind of a, I remember in the early 2010s, like uh, DSLR sliders were becoming really affordable. And so I felt like every single short film you watch had like for no reason whatsoever, just like a sliding shot, establishing shot. And they do look nicer, but it also, I mean, maybe being a filmmaker, you're kind of like looking out for that. And like, oh, this person just got a slider and they really want to use it, um, which I get, you know, you, you have that gear, you want to use it. But again, I guess all that is to say like, yeah, just think about what, what you want your film to feel like. Um, are you trying to build some tension and atmosphere through shots and, or is it, you know, is it a comedy that just needs to be like, you know, have some, some, some good staging of jokes, um, you know, but otherwise not too fancy camera work. I think it can depend. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Hey, if you know, if you know any sets that you can be on where they're just like, Hey, we're just going to shoot the most beautiful shots forever. Call yeah. me. I'd be more than happy to join y'all, but yeah, definitely agree definitely. with you, Travis. You, you definitely, everything that you're doing is at least, uh, trying to serve the story. You're always yeah. looking like, how, how are we serving the story with this? And it's cool if you're just like, Hey man, I'm just doing this shot for me. Cause I want to pay tribute to, you know, Carpenter on Halloween that yeah. really inspired me. And that's why I'm doing this. And you're like, mm -hmm. okay, great. It's going to take us an extra day or two, and, and that's that. Yeah, if, if you have the budget and time <laughs> for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but, uh, but I agree with you 110%. Um, it's definitely, once you start getting into production, everything's very intentional because so much pre-production would have, hopefully, conversations would have happened. Mm -hmm. But we're talking, like, uh, on, on a bigger scale. Uh, let's, let's bring her back down, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up here on, on the smaller scale to, okay, you are just starting out and, you know, you, you shoot, you shoot your first film and you shot it on, you know, you can have access these days to some pretty quality equipment. You get yourself an FX9, FX3, Canon C70. And let's say you, you put together a short film and, and you filmed it. You got it in the can. Congratulations. Yes. 
now you're moving on into post and you tell yourself like, well, I don't know any editor, so I'm going to edit this thing. So you edit it. Then you're like, well, man, it's, I shot it in log. I should have, oh, now I got to figure out how to color correct it. I thought it was going to be pretty simple because I saw this YouTube video and I could buy this like extension and I'd be able to tweak it and then, or drop a LUT on it. That's a whole nother conversation to mm -hmm. talk about lookup tables. Yeah. But what should one be thinking about? How can we serve and save these people? What's the conversation look like if they would have had the foresight to connect with you and talk with you? What could they be helping themselves to prepare? So that way, when they do finish editing, they're already thinking like, okay, I'm going to hand this over to a colorist. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. What's the turnaround time? How much should they, you know, not to hold you to any price because this is an evergreen video, but like, what's the cost and things like that to, in the time uh, they should allow a week, two weeks? And a budget. Yeah, um, I think it can depend on the the length of the project as well as um, a big thing when it comes to color grading is just the variety of shots. If you have something that's two hours long, but it's uh, you know a seminar like a two camera seminar um, or three, maybe you'd have to like work on matching the cameras. But really, that's not going to take long at all because really you're just working with one setup. It's just like them up on the up on the stage, but like a you know a thirty second commercial that's you know kind of twenty different setups, um, each with their own look, their own lighting, their own production design. Uh, that could take longer. Um, so other than just like you know getting you know getting the timeline to the colorist along with the source footage and you know a reference um, reference video or shot uh, of you know, your, your edit for them to, to base it on. Um, I would say just, you know, deliver and be ready to talk about what you want these to look like. If you have any specific targets, uh, if you have kind of a, an inspiration, um, or, you know, say you didn't get to do with the pre-production developing a look or anything like that. Um, just being able to tell them, um, what you want or how things should look or give, providing them with the reference images, um, would be really important. Um, I think when it comes to like time and budget, it really depends. I mean, you know, if you're going to, I know a lot of colorists who, you know, they were also similar to me, they, they started doing their own color work. Um, they work out of their home office, home studio, um, as opposed to going to like an agency, um, or a post, a post studio. Um, the level of equipment that they may have is very different. I mean, you could spend, um, you know, five grand as a colorist, you could spend five grand, 10 grand on video, uh, color equipment like for your pipeline from your computer to your monitor getting things that can be calibrated and that would be like a starting point <laughs> um i've you know i've seen people professional colors who say like you're never gonna have like an actual good like a reference monitor um until you start spending over ten thousand dollars um so the amount so where you take it can can uh, <laughs> the budget can can adjust be adjusted accordingly um i'm a member it's a facebook group it's the blue collar post collective um a friend i, th I think i met him here in austin matt latham um but that's just it's kind of like a just a group on um facebook and every year they do like kind of a uh, a rate questionnaire asking everybody like how much they get paid how much they charge um and yeah for most colorists i think um starting out you know, you're going to be paying or being charged 60 to $100 an hour. Um, and, you know, 60 would be on the, the lower level, um, but that's kind of the range. Um, and that's if they do hourly. They might do day rate. Um, now, so if you're in the situation where you don't have a, a big budget for that, you need, you kind of want to have an idea. You, you need this to be done quicker because you don't want to spend a lot of time You'd want to go to someone that you trust um, and having as many references as possible uh, for them, how you want it to look would be really helpful. And just being able to respond to them quickly, um, maybe even setting some parameters like, hey, work up to this amount of time and then uh, contact me and we can kind of see how things are looking. Um, there can be a lot of back and forth between the colorist and the client. And the more, 
the more uh, kind of hands in there, the more the longer it'll take. So if the director's answering to someone at like a creative agency or the client, and the client wants it to look a certain way, you know, sometimes they'll be like, "This is our color blue." That the color blue in in the uh, the the spot needs to be this color. Um, everybody has the more the more people involved. I mean, it's the same for editing. I'm actually like a, a full time editor um, at a studio in town, Best Wishes Studio, um, and I've been editing and shooting for them for a while. Um, but you know, we we work for HGTV and Food Network, um, and depending on the the number of people who need input, that just adds that much more time onto it. Um, and time is money. Um, so I think if you are like a, a lower budget production, really just having all your your ducks in a row, um, knowing exactly what you want is going to be the fa- the easiest way to get what you want and save money at the same time. Thank you for that, Travis. Absolutely. Yep. You know, once again, as, as, as you continue to see in a lot of our conversations here, it's like it, the, the answer really is it depends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's a tricky thing. Like, I don't think there's any, that's, that's why I think on set experience or, you know, if you're color grading, you know, post, post experience, um, is the best way to do it. Um, get out of your, your comfort zone. Your, it, it'll take a little bit if you're working with a circle of friends. That can be its own challenge. Um, but you really do need to um, get out of your comfort zone and get in a wide variety of situations because all of that experience um, just comes back to feed into making your work better um, where you're, you encounter a weird situation and you think, oh, um, I was on set once and even though I didn't do this thing. I was around somebody who had this great idea to handle this in this way, or I heard somebody talking about this. Um, so I, I used to, when I first started, like getting into cinematography. You know, I was reading all the books and whatever, and I had a big list that had all these different kinds of shots and like how you could do them. And I don't know. Some now I look at those things and I was like, I I read through this. It was helpful, but it, I I never really came back to it. it it's, it was the onset experience um, and just doing things, finding work, working with people, working with good people that, that led to the most growth. That's awesome. And, and, and as we wrap up here, one thing that I hear you always going back to is um, the importance if someone's coming to a colorist or even a director of photography at that matter or anybody that has a project is having a lookbook. Um, references, mm-hmm. something that you could put together that's tangible for people to be like, this is what this is what it feels like. This is the texture of it. Do you would you be willing to share an example of a lookbook that we can link below, um, so that way uh, they can get an idea of what that looks like? Yeah, um, I would. Uh, uh, one of the directors I work with, um, he's done quite a few, so I think I could do that. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess it depends on or a website or, or something that you can recommend. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be work that you know because you got to get clearance on stuff like that. Yeah, but, but like um, a, an example for people to be like, hey, this is this is what I mean. Yeah, I would I would love to uh, be able to share something from a project I've worked on. Um, if not, there uh, there actually are. Uh, I can't remember the, the name of it now. It's not. It's like shot something. Oh, shot deck. Shot deck. Yeah. Shot Deck uh, has a ton. Um, Shot Deck's actually perfect for references. If yeah, for it's like designed yeah, yeah for references. It um, costs though. Shot Deck cost. Yeah, um, I had the free trial for a while. It was really cool. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, Shot Deck's a lot of fun. Um, that that actually that's a great point. That's a great point, Travis. That right there is is shotdeck.com, I believe it is, and um, go there. And when you go there, uh, you get. I think you get like three months for free or something like mm-hmm. that. But the point is of the exercise is for you to see that is what a lookbook is. You go in there, you find reference images, you put it together on any type of document, and then you share it with everybody who's involved in your project to say, this is what we're going for. And in there, you'll see more descriptions and things like that. And you'll start to learn like, oh, these are things that I need to communicate to my team. Because ultimately, your learning is how to communicate so that way, other people, other talented people, can mm-hmm. manifest the vision. Um, but that's a, that, I'm glad you brought that up. That's really great. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I noticed that a lot of times people are like, oh, "I want to send you a lookbook," or "You should need to do a lookbook." And they're like, "Well, what does that look like? Is mm-hmm. there like a template?" It's like, 
Well, it's just essentially a bunch of, it's like, it's like Pinterest. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just a collection of images that people like. And, um, like, uh, with shot deck too, I think it was made from some people in the industry. They may have been like camera department or maybe colorists. Uh, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, lookbooks, they basically, they're a director or whoever's way of telling you, like, I want, I want it to look like this. And, you know, lookbooks are made for, um, DPs, mm -hmm. um, and still really critical to that, uh, like anything else is you, you can never be sure that you, the director, whoever built this lookbook, they know why they picked an image. Um, sometimes as a colorist or even as a DP, you really need to decode and kind of figure out, read between the lines of what someone is telling you. Like, I like this shot. Um, like what do they like about it? If they can't tell you, um, you know, I want the contrast to look exactly like this. I like, you know, where the blacks are, I like the highlights. Um, if they're just like, I don't know, it just like looks good. You need to be able to extract that information from them or kind of, kind of make an educated guess. You kind of get a sense for, for what someone wants. Um, one trick I know that, uh, colors use, and I've used it a few times is, you know, when you're presenting options to a customer, um, you'll purposefully go a little off the edge in one direction because then you can always dial it back as opposed to like pumping more into it. Um, it's like in, just an interesting way of like figuring out the limits of what the director wants, like uh, just kind of feeling that out. Um, but yeah, lookbook, lookbooks are really helpful. Um, they can be conversation starters because you can say like, oh yeah, I really like this image. Or even if you know the movie that it came from, you can kind of give it some context or be like, did you, did you like the shot? Because you know, you're just getting, that's another part of this, like with shot deck or anything else or a lookbook, you are getting just like a 2D images. You don't know if there's any movement in that, that picture um, or if the lights, the colors changed. Um, there are now, uh, these days, a lot more people are doing, um, I can't remember what they call them, but basically building mock-ups of what you want or the feeling that you want by taking shots from other scenes, commercials, music videos, mm -hmm. and kind of piecing that together into kind of like a, a quasi-trailer. Yeah, like a sizzle? Yeah, yeah, kind of like a, a sizzle, um, just using things, other images from other um other projects. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be really helpful for color too. Um, if they, they say that, cause there, there is a big difference between, I mean, as a colorist, like getting the colors dialed in on like a single image, like a freeze frame, and then you watch it back or see shots back to back and you're like, Oh wow, it, this looked fine to my images when it was paused, when it, there was no movement. Uh, but now that there's movement there, it feels different in a way, or like these scenes like match to each other in a different way. Um, those are kind of like the, those indescribable things you have to be prepared for. Be ready to make a judgment on um, as a color story DP. Well, that was a really good uh, nugget there as well. Taking it further from a lookbook all the way to like, well, okay, that looks good on, on 2D, but when you take it over to moving images, mm -hmm. is that is that still maintaining the integrity that you wanted? That's That's a really good point. Yeah. That's that's really big. Yeah, and getting over to, yeah, in in um, when you're raising money for a film, that also technically work, works really well. And getting together like a sizzle from other films, mm -hmm. piecing it together, and being like, we haven't shot anything, but this is what we're looking the field to look like. Yeah. So um, all these beautiful little tools to be able to use to help support you, Travis. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. This was awesome. Loved hearing talking with you about all this beautiful stuff. Travis is available here in Austin, Texas as a director, photographer, and a colorist. Also does editing as well. Um, but uh, yeah, brother, look forward to collaborating with you more. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing with us all of your tips and tricks and sharing your story so people here can get a little know, get to know a little bit more about you. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Renee. Appreciate it.